Hi, uh, this is James Patterson and I'm delighted to be here with you to have another chat with a good friend and colleague of mine, uh, Greg Coleman. We're going to talk about preparing for an external quality assurance review, an EQA. And uh, as some of you will know, I was the head of internal audit for AstraZeneca. I've been doing training now for the last 10 years uh, and I'm involved in areas like assurance mapping, root cause analysis, and I wrote the book called Lean Auditing. Greg, uh, let's get you to introduce yourselves. Yeah, so uh, James, thank you. I've got 25 years of, of governance experience. I've worked in both, been based in both the UK and the US, um, and my roles have covered governance, uh, risk management, and, and ethics. Um, I'm both uh, ACA and uh, CIMA uh, qualified, um, and I've been uh, Chief Audit Executive for three PLCs uh, listed on the UK Stock Exchange, and two of them are FTSE 50. Um, I'm a member of the Chartered Institute's EQA panel. Um, there's about 20 of us ex-heads of audit that do these reviews, and I also um, work with the French equivalent, IFASI, um, to do reviews for them. And uh, like yourself, James, as you know, I do a little bit of training, not in the same league, but I focus a bit on best practice and particularly communication skills. And you're a very engaining uh, trainer, Greg, I know, because we work together yeah, and uh, yes, we talk about yeah, some of clients. <clears throat> So uh, in terms of what we're going to discuss, we're going to talk briefly about the requirements for an external quality assessment. Uh, I think Greg's going to talk about what it's trying to achieve uh, and the process. Uh, we'll start to talk about some misunderstandings. So people often have an impression of what this is going to be like um, and the reality is slightly different. We're also going to talk about uh, things that people find uh, and that's why it's so fabulous to have Greg here because he really has, I mean I've got experience but Greg's got even more experience on this topic. Uh, we'll talk about the whole question of who is going to do your external quality uh, assessment and um, as Greg said he's on a panel and I've been involved in the IIA panel and so there's a range of people that can do your external quality assessment and we'll talk about some of the issues around that and then the final thing is not to see this as a tick the box exercise uh, but to make sure it actually contributes to internal audit and potentially even beyond that. Greg, talk us a little bit through the, uh, the various institute standards so people can understand that. Yeah, so if you're a member of the IIA, and you, you really should be, um, there, there's two, two areas that sort of apply. Um, the first is the internal standard. So you've got the 1310, the 1311, and that's all around the quality assurance and improvement program. And there's been a real push on that over the last few years by the IIA in terms of trying to make sure that you're doing a quality job, but you're continuously improving what you do. That says that you need to do both internal and external assessments. And typically what happens is that um, most well-managed audit functions have periodic self-assessments. They, they'll do a checklist or they'll review themselves against the standards on the, the years that they don't do um, external reviews. Um, and, and, and some of this is quite important because if you think about it, the audit committee every year has to say that it's looked at the, um, the efficiency or the effectiveness of the internal audit department. So, that, you know, the real question is how are they able to give that assurance if, if there's nothing in place that the audit team themselves do? Or you could have it done by someone else within the organisation, like the company secretary maybe, as long as they've got the ability to, uh, to, to apply a sensible, um, a sensible knowledge. Underneath you can see there's the self-assessment box on the right hand side and then left is preparedness review and that's where for example you've got an EQA coming up, an external one, but you want to just make sure that there's not going to be any great gaping holes in, in, uh, in what you're doing already. And then on the left hand side you've got the external and this is the requirement that the IA says that once every five years you should have an external review by an independent assessor, someone who's qualified to do that. Um, and there are various parts of that. The IIA um, requirement is also in the public sector standards as well. And as we say, you know, with the, uh, with the corporate governance code requirement for the audit committee, this is a really good way of demonstrating to the audit committee um, that your team is doing an effective job. And the 
There are different types. Um, you've got the facilitated self-assessment, which is where, again, you check yourself against the standards and then a reviewer comes in and sort of challenges and assesses how well that's been done. Or you have the full external quality assessment and the depth and breadth of that could vary a lot. I mean, James and I um, have, have been involved in a couple of things where it does depend a little bit on kind of what the audit committee and the stakeholders are looking for from this review. So there's a requirement to assess against the standards, but clearly the depth and breadth in terms of interviews with people and the amount of stakeholder engagement, that can vary a lot. I mean, on the one hand, you can just talk to the chair of the audit committee and a few of the senior management, other audit functions request us to talk to a very wide range of um, operational management across the organisation. Great. And we'll, in fact, talk a little bit more about these choices uh, a little bit later and some good practices shortly. Thanks so much, Greg, for just walking us through that. Um, and then, obviously, there's the question of who do you choose? And we'll, we'll come back to that question a little bit later. Uh, Greg, tell people a little bit uh, about what this is uh, all about, really, in, in layman's terms. We could also have audit committee members on this video, so they may be curious to know some of the, uh, the key points. Well, and I think the point you made earlier, James, about this not being a checklist uh, or a tick list approach is, is absolutely vital. So, you know, the key thing with a good effectiveness review is you'll use the IA standards as the backbone, but you're really looking to make sure that the department is meeting its stated purpose and remit, and it's standing within the organisation. So, in other words, it's not just a question of saying, does the chief audit executive report through to the CEO, which is increasingly what's being pushed for, and the FD, for example, uh, and uh, the, ex uh, the chair of the audit committee, but it's, it's whether that reporting is, is, is a really strong relationship and whether the, the head of audit is actually giving some good advice and is willing to challenge and really sort of stand up for him or herself. We also look at the people, the resourcing. Do you have the skills in the department? Do you, are you able to bring in co-source from a big accounting firm or a small boutique team if you're looking at something like Treasury, for example? These are areas where, on the one hand, as auditors, you can always assess the function or the process against the policies and procedures. But I would challenge that and say that doesn't always add value. You know, sometimes it's worth bringing in expertise to say, are the procedures and processes right? Can, can they be done in a more effective way? We look at the method, methodology and the processes and tools, and that can involve things like sampling, um, data analytics, and so on. And some organizations still use Word and Excel spreadsheets, and that's perfectly adequate. Others obviously have teammate or more established um, work paper um, uh, software that they use. We also look at the performance, uh, the quality assurance, um, the efficiency, whether they're actually making a difference, whether they're looking at the key risks in the organization or whether they're kind of just going through the motion. So we, we do challenge the, the audit team and we're trying to bring value by saying, look, you know, are you meeting the needs of the corporate governance within your organization, especially given everything that's changing? And then finally, we typically look at the outputs, you know, the reports. What we often do find, and, and James, I'm sure you've got some comments on this as well, is that reporting can often be improved. I mean, you know, the worst case scenario, you've got heads of audit sending reports to chairs of audit committees and audit committee members, and they're incredibly granular. There's a real sense of, you know, almost wanting to show all the workings rather than actually taking that step back and saying, what's the strategic view that the audit committee and the senior execs will want? Brilliant, Greg. That's absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much. Let's talk through the process itself in a little bit more detail um, in terms of what sorts of things the internal audit function does and then what we do with the external assessor. Greg, walk us a little bit through this. Yeah, so I mean, the first thing obviously is the, the function itself needs to think about the review, it needs to talk with the audit committee, executive team, think about the scope, discuss it. And being quite candid, some organisations, you have the, the head of the audit team who wants to do the review, but the budget just isn't there. So sometimes there's a degree of persuasion and lobbying required here to you know, get agreement that now is the time to do the external effectiveness review. You obviously have to tender and find the, the necessary provider uh, and then agree, you know, what the service is, timetable, fees and so on and so forth. I don't know if you want to add anything to that, that area, James, or pick it up later on. 
Yeah, yeah, you keep going. Let's give okay. people a quick overview. Um, yeah. And the next thing is very collaborative. Um, you know, the, the EQA team will work closely with the audit function. And I think it's important to remember that there will be an element of time involved. You can't just sort of leave the EQA team to get on with it. Um, they'll look at prior EQA assessments, key documents, and send out a survey and arrange um, interviews. That's something that we can do remotely, typically. Then we have the stakeholder meetings, and these can be extremely valuable. And as I mentioned before, can range from just a few people to quite a broad, uh, broad group. Um, we have ongoing team meetings with the internal audit team, talking about you know, what are we gonna do, um, and we'll keep them up to date as we go through the, the field work, as it were. And we do review audit files as well, but I would make the point there that we're not trying to second guess the audit team to see you know, whether they've done things in the exact right way. It's a little bit more about making sure that their processes are being followed, that their scoping is sensible and the risks are being identified correctly. And indeed what comes out at the end, the report, is reflective of what they found. Um, there's the survey we talked about, the stakeholder results are all brought together. And sometimes there's supplementary questions with, with various people. We'll talk to the external auditors sometimes. We'll talk to the uh, providers if they have a, an agreement in place with subject matter experts, co-source, for example. Can I just make a couple of builds on this? So the first thing in terms of the selection of the EQA provider, I think there's a really critical point for the head of audit to be clear that it's not just for them to decide who the EQA assessor is. I've seen people thinking, oh, I'm, I'm quite friendly with them, I'll choose them, and I'll just do a basic review against the standards. And the question then is, yeah, but what's your audit committee going to think if that's what you do? So certainly, whether you're a head of internal audit, senior management or an audit committee, I think you all need to have some involvement about what would be the characteristics of the firm that you choose. And then a couple of other points to highlight from what Greg said. The first one is the reason you send a survey out, and this is standard, is because there's a requirement for internal audit to add value. So the survey basically asks stakeholders do you think internal audit has added value? Do you think internal audit has been insightful? So just to make that, that connection. And then the other important thing that Greg highlighted, which I completely agree with, is a good EQA team will talk to the internal audit team itself, not simply the head of audit and the audit management team. And that's important because the head of audit, the head of quality, the management team may have their view of what the strengths of the in, and, and weakness of the internal audit team are. But once you start asking the audit team themselves, they might go, well, actually, I don't think we are that good on training or whatever. So just to kind of emphasize why the process is uh, the way it is. So having done that, Greg, talk us through the, the final stages here. Yes, yeah, so I mean, if I'm doing the review with the, um, the IIA, the Chartered IIA, or, or indeed IFASI, there's typically a couple of us doing the review. Um, we pull together our thoughts, we'll do a, a checklist effect, uh, we'll look at the standards and just see against each of the standards whether the function is generally conforming, partially conforming, or, or not conforming. Um, and typically the report that we write has two parts. The first part is around conformance with the standards and they obviously, uh, any actions have to be uh, identified there need to be addressed. And then the second part is more around insights, um, supplementary thoughts, benchmarking, you know, things that the team could do differently to improve their effectiveness. So in other words, they're not requirements that are needed to be done in order to comply with the standards, but they add value and they're things that the team should think about. We, we, we draft a report and typically have a close out meeting as any audit with the uh, audit department and certainly the head of audit, often the senior management team. And then there's a couple of iterations usually as we finalize the report and the proposed actions. And then finally, um, the audit function um, usually present the report in some format to the next audit committee um, and would typically do stakeholder briefings and update, it, you know, update the actions as they go and, and have some sort of debrief. And it's, it's an ongoing thing. I mean, the idea is that you do the effectiveness or the external quality assurance review, and then over a number of months, obviously the actions are done and hopefully put in place some new, some new processes and new ways of doing things if you've added value. Just a couple of builds on what you're saying there, Greg. So the, the technical role of a quality assessment is to say, 
here's where you stand against the standards. That's the basic. And then it can also be, where are you against best practices? And then there'll be the question of what is agreed to be done about this feedback. Yes. And one of the things that will happen is, well, how long should it take and what will it involve? And one of the benefits of having somebody fairly experienced is they might know which things should be fixed first and practical ways of fixing them. Um, but the other thing to emphasize in terms of how quickly things are fixed is there may be issues, number one, in terms of the resourcing to help the audit team do what it needs to do, or number two, the audit committee or senior management support to get some of those actions done. And we'll come back to this a little bit later. Um, but that's brilliant, Greg. Thank you so much uh, for kind of doing that uh, overview. So um, just to kind of emphasize a really critical point based on my experience, I think a lot of people imagine, you know, even auditors, that what the quality process will do is basically check whether the detail of the audit activity is compliant with the IA standards. And that involves, as Greg said, looking at work papers and checking on the way that internal audit is following things up. It's vital to understand, and Greg said this, but I want to emphasize the importance that actually the, the, the scale and the scope of a quality insurance program and of an external quality assessment is to look at these bigger things that Greg talked about, the role, okay, the coverage, the quality of the staff, and it's also to look at um, the quality of the way the internal audit function is communicating with the audit committee and uh, senior management. So, this is often strangely where you get the findings is people have done a lot of work to make sure that their audit papers are up to date but what they haven't really done is thought, thought about some of these more strategic uh, related uh, issues any builds on this greg um, before we go to the next slide no i, I think that's absolutely right I do, I do think there can be a danger of getting into the detail and not having that strategic perspective which certainly is ahead of audit you really do need in order to communicate with senior management so um greg and i um i'm involved in training on preparing for external quality assessments and helping people prepare uh, greg is involved in that but also uh, doing uh, quality assessments and I thought it might be useful we would, when we were preparing for this, we just thought we would give uh, people watching this a quick overview of what the actual Institute of Internal Audit Standards are from 2017. And I've tried to set this out uh, in a clear way. There are lots of different versions of this, but here you can say, you can see just based on that scope that the actual um, doing the audits is in the 2000s, 2100, 2200, 2300, and then there are all these other uh, standards as well uh, that you need to think about. So I just thought uh, people watching this uh, might like to uh, see that. And there's lots of different ways of communicating this, aren't there, Greg? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And, and I mean, I, I would absolutely encourage people, even if they're not thinking about an EQA in the immediate future, to, to look at the standards and, and, and just sort of try and make sure that you are covering them all off, as James says. And then the next thing to say, I'm going to hand back to Greg in a second, um, is, you know, there is a fundamental point, And again, I can't stress this enough to people watching this video of distinguishing between, is this quality assessment gonna be about compliance with the Institute of Internal Audit standards? And we've just seen them. Is it going to be about compliance with other Institute of Internal Audit or regulatory codes? And Greg mentioned earlier that there is a public sector internal audit standard called SIAS. And there's also though in the UK in particular, an interesting standard for financial services. And there's also a new um, code for, for in, uh, internal audit functions for the UK. So again, this question of, so am I just doing the basic rules or am I looking at other codes? 
And then there's this issue of benchmarking against either good or best practice. And that might look at things like how good is the kind of lean agile approach of the audit function. Greg mentioned shorter audit reports. Uh, there's a whole technology dimension to an effective internal audit team, both the work papers, but also the ability to analyze and automate data in the business. And there's this question of business alignment um, and the impact that Greg mentioned. And then obviously, as we said, the capability of the team, but even the role of the audit team in being a place to develop staff. And I can't stress enough that this issue of, OK, which benchmark are we comparing against? And is this a fair benchmark uh, is really crucial. And it's very easy for people to blur this, and I would say both to audit committee members and to heads of audit watching this or quality people watching this, you need to be clear what the yardstick is because that will give you a much more nuanced and balanced perspective on where the audit function really stands. Any other comments uh, on this, Greg? No, no, I, th I think you're, you're absolutely right there, James. The separation between the, you know, the the things that you need to conform with, whether that be, you know, one of those top two there um, in bold on the areas you've shown, and and then the degree to which you want compliance or benchmarking is uh, because clearly that that's around best practice, and that, as you said, does become a bit more judgmental, doesn't it? And uh, it's it's slightly a uh, slightly more grey area, let's say. And again, that's where the genuine experience of the assessor in knowing, well, is that really a best practice that's actually been implemented for a comparable situation? Or are you just reading from a textbook what the best practice is? I think that's one of the really important things to kind of understand if you're on the receiving end of this. So Greg, talk to us uh, about what we would hope to see and some of the kind of key areas that people maybe don't do as well as uh, they should be. Yeah, I think <clears throat> obviously most organisations, audit teams know that they're, you know, they, they should have a risk-based approach and, and that's the, the, you know, the way to go. But I think it's important to make it clear to their stakeholders that internal audit doesn't audit everything and indeed isn't able to audit some of the high priority risks. So, you, we, you know, one of the requirements is that you look at the annual plan and you'll link it back to the strategic goals and the, the risks for the organisation. But I think it's quite important for uh, heads of audit to be honest with people and say look you know these these risks here are outside our remit therefore we're not going to look at them because we can't or if you want us to look at them we will have to bring in some quite specialist resource to do that the other one you've highlighted there is the coordination um, with other assurance providers that's something that can be very difficult to do. Some heads of audit, when we do our review, say, oh yeah, I meet regularly with the second line. Um, but, and, and maybe that's even documented in terms of monthly meetings with various people. But I think the challenge we would make there is, is that a true coordination? You know, is it worth thinking about? One of the things I know you train on, James, is, is risk mapping and uh, risk assurance mapping. And that, that can be a really important area of being able to demonstrate who's doing what and who isn't and so on. And, and I think auditors need to think about being value added. I mean, at the end of the day, they, you know, you have to have an audit function. It's pretty much a requirement for most uh, organizations. But, you know, clearly you can't just sit back and think, well, we're, we're safe. You know, you have to be value added. You've got to think about how you help management achieve their objectives and prevent the organization from, uh, you know, uh, having, having problems. And, and, and as James talked about already in terms of the, the team, I mean, we, we, we regularly make recommendations about not so much about them not having the knowledge they need, but thinking a little bit more about where are they going? Think about their career path. You know, are they, are they being trained for the audits that they're going to do? Where are they going to go next in the organization? And, and, and as we say, they're bringing in specialists as required. And, and then the, finally, this thing about require, you know, reporting on, on the compliance, because uh, you know, the, the standards do say that you should be regularly reporting to the audit committee on the progress um, against the various actions that you have in place and the continuous improvement that you want to make. And a couple of builds on that, Greg, on the uh, assurance coordination and the assurance mapping, two things I would say, and you, you highlighted it really well, you know, you might meet with other, the head of compliance or the head of risk, 
well, what the standard requires and, you know, what senior management or the audit committee would want is, are you really relying on that other function in the way that you could? And that requires measuring how much assurance you're getting from other parts of the organization and that's a new requirement from 2017 and it's the measuring bit how much assurance are we getting from it security how much assurance are we getting from our risk of, uh, function that's the question uh, that we get and one final comment i'd say is a central issue there will be uh, the accountability of those other assurance functions and then the other thing I'd say, and you, you talked about the skills, Greg, both earlier and now. I mean, I, I had a, wor a workshop online yesterday, in fact, on auditing governance and strategic risks. And one of the people that I spoke to, and this was overseas in Switzerland, I said, oh, you know, why are you here? And they said, oh, well, I'm doing my governance and strategic risk audit starting tomorrow. That's today for the purposes of this, um, this, this recording. And, you know, I would say the idea that you can just attend an online course and then suddenly make a really insightful contribution to the head of uh, strategy or to the company secretary in relation to government it's just not realistic and so I do see sometimes auditors giving it a good go but as Greg said you end up with the auditor saying whether the paperwork has been followed not really whether this is a best practice process and whether some nuances have been missed okay um, just a couple of other things um, from, uh, from me. Inevitably, there's always pressure on an internal audit function to do kind of core assurance like finance or regulatory or cybersecurity. But I think the issue of what's the balance between doing the work on that and doing business related things, corporate initiatives, acquisitions, integrations, projects and so on so the question of how clearly can you see that balance in the audit plan um, would be a point the other thing that i've said uh, and i've seen is people saying well we would like to do more strategic audit but the risk function or the compliance function are not as good as they could be and therefore we're having to do this basic stuff and one of the things that will come out from a, an external quality assessment is well, okay, that's fine, but where have you communicated officially that you're worried about the quality of compliance or risk management functions? Anything to say on that point, Greg, the interaction with the second line, and then I've got a couple more points. Yeah, I mean, I think just generally on both those things, I think it is quite important to have a clear idea of what your remit is. And as you say, James, it does vary. I mean, when you look at different internal audit departments, you realise that some are quite narrowly focused and that may be what the audit committee wants and the, the you know the senior execs and that's what they're willing to fund it's the where their risk appetite sits and that's what they want from audit whereas there are others that try to be all things to all people and obviously they can fall into a, a a trap as well so so i do think you're absolutely right james it's about having that clarity over what your role is and as you were saying with regard to second line and so on you know how does that impact is that providing proper assurance or not and are you saying that to the senior management team and the audit committee if required yeah that the key thing here is transparency if you have as a head of audit communicated that this is what you're doing because and you're not ashamed of it that'll be fine but it's when you know that you're not auditing for example some areas or not doing something or doing too much of something and you're not telling the stakeholders that few other things uh, it's not actually a standard for internal audit to do root cause analysis unfortunately at the moment in 2020 but it is an in, uh, a standard for internal audit to be insightful proactive and future focused and what i would say is and you will see quite frequently against best practice audit teams may not necessarily be doing the root cause analysis that they should be doing or analysis of the themes uh, that they're finding and you get that and you talk when you talk to heads of audit it'll be like I know what I'm gonna find even before I've done this audit 
Um, I had something recently where the audit committee were saying we haven't had any negative, seriously negative or red coloured audit reports for the past couple of years. Does that really mean that the head of internal audit is not being independent enough? And one of the things I could feel in that particular case was a temptation to want to scapegoat the head of internal audit. And this happens, unfortunately, more often than you'd think. And what I was able to do was to kind of look at what would be the underlying reasons why it might be difficult for the head of internal audit to issue a red audit report. And that might be around an ambiguity about the, the, the standards against which people were expecting the business to be operated to. Is the business meant to be operating 100% or is 80-20 okay? Because if you do an audit and you find 90-10, if the standard is 80-20, that means you're all fine. But if 90-10 versus a standard of 100%, that means there should be a red audit report. So that was an example where I was saying, it's not really the head of audit lacking independence. It's maybe a question of not working together to know what uh, the standard should be in different parts of the business. And again, I just want to emphasize when you're dealing with somebody like Greg to spare his blushes, people with experience, they'll be able to see the symptom, but then go behind that to say, what's this really about? Uh, and again, uh, you get this general issue of people not communicating clearly certain things to the audit committee and needing to kind of be clear about what they do and they don't communicate upwards. Any reflections on this, uh, Greg, before uh, we start to get into yeah, kind of I, think James, I think you're right. I think one of the comments we get from stakeholders is that what they're looking for from the head of audit in particular is is that you know this clear, as you say, transparent understanding of what the situation is. And unfortunately, a lot of heads of audit, including myself, we, we come out of the chartered accounting businesses, and there's a tendency, I think, to use what a partner I worked with years ago referred to as the weasel words, you know? And, and you can end up being a bit, you carry out what you're saying, and factually what you're saying is, is correct, but you almost need an interpreter to understand how serious this is. So, you know, and at the most blunt, stakeholders sometimes say, you know, the heads of audit sometimes sit on the fence. They, you know, what the stakeholder wants is someone who's quite brave and is willing to say, no, this isn't good enough. We need to get this fixed. Mm -hmm. And what they actually say is something like, well, there, there, there could be improvements here if this and that. And it becomes a little bit more uh, not nuanced to the point where it's not clear, let's say. Yeah, brilliant. OK, and uh, the final thing to say, and I have had this regularly, is uh, should we outsource the internal audit function? Should we change the head of internal audit? And it's very important, and I think this is one of the reasons why the Institute of Internal Auditors have done well, is a feeling that if somebody's going to do your external quality assessment, feeling there's no agenda in that external quality assessment. And I have literally, I have had this within the last week, you know, should we um, exit this head of internal audit as a result of an external quality assessment? And I'm having to say, you know, I think they deserve uh, a year or two to work on this because there are other reasons why performance is disappointing. It's not purely about their performance, but please be aware, both audit committee members watching this, and uh, heads of audit watching this, there is an issue around scapegoating. And I think a good external quality assessor will not have an agenda, hidden agenda, and will try to look at the complexity around why things are not going so well and not simply try to come up with a scapegoat. Okay, uh, Greg, some advice for people um, about um, the whole EQA process and perhaps uh, kind of uh, things they should be thinking about um, uh, before yeah, they have their external quality. But I think it's around, you know, sort of hopefully a quality process is built into what you're doing. So it isn't a question of sort of papering over the cracks and just starting to prepare before the EQA arrives. There are a few new standards or changes to standards that we've referred to, things like the, uh, the 
uh, assurance, coordination of assurance, and indeed the QAIP itself, the Quality Assurance Improvement Programme, which are relatively new still, although it's a few years old, and sometimes they need, may need a bit more focus. But generally speaking, if you're running a good team, you know, your processes should be relatively it's relatively stable and you should be able to um, uh, you know sort of not have to spend a lot of time getting involved um, with preparing for the EQA because you're already doing a good job you do need to talk to senior management the audit committee you need to make sure they understand what the process involves and what will come out of the review and you know get their get their buy-in absolutely and, and you need to make sure, and again, this comes down to the experience of the, uh, the assessor, that you get credit for what you've already done. I mean, uh, or the areas that you know you're working on or that you need to work, to work against. So, for example, it's, it's just like a regular audit. I mean, if you go in and audit an area and management is aware that they have certain weaknesses and they're addressing them, they get quite upset, quite reasonably, when you raise them in the reports, though you found them for yourself. So it's around managing that process. And, and in a transparency, a word James used earlier, is key here be transparent with your uh, with the eqa team explain to them you know we know we're, we're not where we want to be in this area but we have an action plan and we can demonstrate that to you and so on and yeah as the final point says is the nitpicking you don't want someone coming in and second guessing and someone who's doing it in a theoretical out of the you know out of a textbook approach you want practical solutions that match the size of your team and the environment you work in and a good assessor, whether that's one of the institute people or an independent person, someone who's got the experience, can actually be pragmatic in terms of what they recommend and understand how that will work. Because ultimately, we've been there and we've we've done the job ourselves. Brilliant. I just just building on this as we get into the kind of wrap up mode, I think this issue when you're trying to select an EQA assessor. Can you explain to me how I'm going to get credit for what I already know is a problem? How will that feature in your external quality report? And a good assessor will be able to say, here's where your assessment will feature, and then here is where our judgment will feature. And if it's not clear how those two things are distinguished in the report, you should be asking questions. You know, I'm worried you're going to raise issues which I already know are a problem. And then the other thing that I would say, and it's just trying to join up the dots that Greg's point about not nitpicking, is, you know, I've just done one of these recently. One of the reasons you might look at the detail of an audit file should not be to say, oh, I can't find a signature on this issue. But it might be to say, hmm, are we getting stakeholder feedback that it's not so insightful? we're getting stakeholder feedback that things are not being done in as lean and agile a way as they could be. And now I'm looking at the work papers, I can kind of see why that's happening in the work papers. So what you really want, I think the phrase might be to sort of triangulate, is an assessor who's able to go, that's the big picture issues and the, and the performance and the benchmarking. This is the detailed stuff that's going on in the engine room that's why we're getting this feedback from the stakeholders. And you want that kind of recommendation about changing things in the engine room rather than the nitpicking way of changing things in the engine room, together with advice on what actually works, again, rather than theory. So this issue of, and maybe you can see this, bless, bless us for Greg and I, of have these people been around for a while and have they done it or, you know, so they, do they live in the real world or is this an external quality assessment that's being a little bit done from an academic textbook point of view? Uh, and that's why, again, sparing blushes, uh, when you look at different audit uh, assessment teams, really check the issue of the experience level of the people that are doing that. And certainly uh, with the Institute of Internal Audits in the UK, et cetera, you'll have people who've really been around, seen that, done that. Um, I think we may um, nearly be there, uh, Greg. Any final comments on that before my last remarks? No, no, I think you're absolutely right, James. Yeah, and obviously it helps enormously if the, the assessor has practical experience of your industry. And as you mentioned, on the IA, there's about 20 people on the panel. And as you, you just said, there's a really nice range of experience there. So it isn't a question of having an auditor again who doesn't quite understand the, the, the detail as we, we talked about earlier. And then just a concluding slide, you know, the requirement is to have 
an external quality assessment uh, every uh, five years. But the standards actually say, as Greg was touching upon, that there should be this quality control and this quality uh, improvement program on an annual basis, which should be reported. And what you really want as time goes by is to have this, let's get somebody else to kick the tires to check things out well before we get to the formal external quality assessment. So this idea of getting somebody in and um, again sparing the blushes of Greg and I to sort of kick the tires for you before you then have the full-blown external quality assessment and the more that you do that the less likely you are to have a big surprise the more you kind of leave it and assume you're going to be okay the more there's a chance of something not so nice uh, to come out um, so look, uh, Greg, it's been an absolute pleasure uh, to have you on this uh, video. I'm hoping we'll do this again uh, sometime soon. Uh, you are available, I know, if people uh, want to contact you and they can contact you through me. I'm available uh, via my website, riskai.co.uk. Uh, and uh, hopefully uh, people have got something uh, helpful. Uh, Greg, thank you so much. My pleasure, James. Good to see you again. You too. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.